there is a registration of, uh, of the talk. Uh, there is always the possibility to hear uh, the talk of uh, Dr. Francesco Genki uh, after uh, today. So, uh, a few words about Francesco. He has a PhD uh, from the University of Bologna since 10 years. He's a research fellow from University La Sapienza of Roma, Italian Institute of Oriental Studies. He is the director of the Italian archaeological project Sudaba. Francesco is a specialist in stratigraphic excavation, digital documentation, archaeological survey, landscape mapping. He took part in excavations of Rasalad HD6 and Rasalad, Rasal Jean Soria G2 in Oman and directed field works at the Neolithic site of Rasalad HD2 and the early Iron Age metallurgical site of Ukt that Al Bakra as Safa and the collective graves LCG1 and LCG2 at Daba, and he will talk today about the, this uh, specific site of Daba. Outside Oman, he worked in Central and Southeast Asia, as well as in Eritrea and Maghreb and Italy, of course. Please. Francesco, you may begin your talk. Thank you so much, Sophie. Good morning, everyone, and thanks to Guillaume and Sophie for this kind invitation to talk about our research in Daba. Talking about Daba necropolis means touching on many features of the funerary archaeology in the Arabian Peninsula. So I will divide it, the communication into three sections. Uh, the first dedicated to the configuration of the site and, and the tombs. The second on the burial practices and the use of the tombs. And the third related to the archaeological material. Diba is located on the eastern coast of the Muzandan Peninsula, directly overlooking the Gulf of Oman. Given its geographic location, Diba must have played some role in interregional exchange in the prehistory and protohistory, possibly, possibly as a port through which non-local goods could have been imported and traded from the east coast to the west coast and interior. As you can see in this uh, historical map, it's a strategic place in terms of natural features, starting from his shielded gulf, therefore a perfect landing place and above all, thanks to the natural corridor uh, running among the mountains that connect Daba with the interior and the west coast. All the area is a rich archaeological region, considering the presence of many essential sites, both settlement and funerary complex, scattered all over on the coastal and interior area. As can be seen from this map, funerary complexes consisting of several tombs are widespread in the geographical area. And uh, I refer to Shimal complex and Jebel Bukais complex, for example, as well as corridor tombs are particularly diffused in the region from the Wadi Souk phase up to the late Iron Age in some cases. And I refer to the, for example, to the large tombs of Katara, Bidia, Bitna, Diba Fujaira, and so on. The large burial complex of Daba, like that of Safa in the Rubarkali desert, was discovered accidentally in the summer of 2012, when none of us were present in Oman, including Maurizio Tosi, at that time advisor for archaeology of the Minister of Heritage. Traces of the necropolis appeared during the work of an extension of a sporting club in Daba. It's a large burial area, which currently includes two large collective graves, a Parthian tomb, and a several ritual circular pits. 
Despite geophysical analysis, as you can see in this slide, carried out on the site, show the presence of at least five other large tombs in the area. I think it's necessary to summarize the various moments that have characterized this research, starting with the first exploration carried out by the archaeologist from the Ministry of Heritage, who practically emptied the tomb. It's a subterranean corridor-shaped tomb, 14 meter long by three meter wide, about one and a half deep. 888 individuals have been identified inside, accompanied by around 4,000 objects of great value, if we exclude the almost 5,000 beads of various types. In reconstructing the work of the ministry and on the basis of the further discoveries, it was understood that a lot of objects also came from one or two large pits located around the tomb. Maurizio Tosi immediately realized the, the importance of the discovery, tried to, uh, to and sent first Maurizio Catani to carry out a survey of the structure for a short period in December 2012. Then in April, a small group that, uh, co coordinated by me to complete the excavation of the bottom of the tomb and to carry out some trenches for verification. During this activity, three ritual pits were found related to the first collective grave and containing dozens of objects. But it was only during the next seasons that the second biggest collective grave tomb was discovered. The team was working to search for further pits around the first tomb. And the first wall of the, of the second grave were discovered in the Southern area. So after exposing the perimeter at the end of December, 2013, and verifying the length of the tomb, an excavation season was launched in collaboration with the ministry between 2014 and 2015 that shed light on the last phases of the tombs to use. The second collective grave is a semi-subterranean grave characterized by a monumental configuration and impressive slab door and a corridor to reach the main chamber. So as you can see from this plan, the burial complex currently consists mainly of two collective graves and the monumental uh, and five ritual pits. This is an uh, aerial photo showing the configuration of the excavation area at the end of the last seasons. Before presenting the results of the last excavation season in the second tomb, I would like to briefly illustrate the, the differences between the two collective tombs. The first and most important difference is the period of use. The first is like a strong box, used for a precise period and sealed. Structurally, it does not reveal any substantial changes. It's a typical corridor tomb, usually sealed with a series of protruding slabs. Its use, therefore, seems to be not too much prolonged, despite the presence of the pits around the structure suggests that there have been movement of object, mainly to create space inside the corridor. Its duration range from the late Bronze Age to the Iron Age II on the basis of find. The second is uh, more impressive, both in terms of its length and the thickness and the height of these walls. But above all, it differs from the first in that it was used for a long period of time, resulting in a number of modifications, rearrangements, and renovation, in addition to producing a quantity of finds from the Iron Age II period, when the structure seems to have been built until late pre-Islamic period. 
So a different element between the tombs is the size, because the second is longer, deeper, and with thicker walls. One of the main differences between the two tombs lies in the construction techniques. The first is a tomb with a completely subterranean chamber, with the entrances therefore located at the head of the perimeter wall, a step to descend into the sun into the chamber. And is a type that is widespread in the area, particularly in the older corridor tombs. Above all, it's a tomb, as we have already pointed out, that has not been substantially altered. The second tomb, on the other hand, show a semi subterranean chamber with perimeter wall up to the two meter high, an entrance with access door built into the wall face. But above all, it has been renovated several times in view of its long use. The discovery of the last season, in any case, led to the recognition of a similarity between the two tombs, as the central corridor with a bell-shaped profile corresponding to the original construction was also recognized in the second one too. From this photo, one can recognize the exterior face of the perimeter walls that later allowed the construction of the entrance door in the east wall that led into the original burial chamber. In detail, we see the entrance door created in the wall face, which is clearly different from the entrances of the first tomb, which are at the head of the wall. And here are some comparison for the entrance door that are widespread in the region, mainly in the tombs of Daya in the Emirates of Ras al Khaimah, or in some tombs in the necropolis of Jebel Bukais. They are less impressive, but the configuration is very, very similar. On the other hand, one of the similarities that characterize the two tombs lies in the construction of the wall face. The construction technique, in fact, provides for the placement of large wadi boulders at the base of the structures, in particular in the first three or four rows, followed by a series of slabs placed horizontally and in a projecting position up to the highest part of the tomb, in order to facilitate the arrangement of the closing slabs. This is, the, this is the first one, uh, internal side, and this is the second to internal side. It's very, very similar. The second one is more, more, more biggest and more highest. And the closure of, of the tomb, in fact, had to take place through the arrangement of a large slab to seal the corridor, resting on the underlying project slabs according to a scheme that was proposed by Vogt in 1998. Two types of covering of the corridor tombs are proposed. The most plausible reconstruction for our tombs seems to be the one above in the Vogt scheme, the so-called Shimal type, based on the characteristic of the internal profile that the two tombs of Daba present. As regards the origin of this type of corridor tomb, a possible similarity come from context of the Bronze Age of Luristan, investigated in the 60s by Vandenberg, in particular in the Pushtiku region. Necropolis such as Bani Shurma and Kalenizar feature identical burial structures. These are tombs characterized by long corridor chambers that have the same construction technique the same dimension and depth, including the technique of covering with large slabs. These are obviously examples referable to more ancient phases, such as the Early Bronze Age, but in any case, they are tombs used up to the second millennium in Iran. So if you want to look for an origin in the, in the tomb of Daba, it could be a possible example, considering that among the material present in the grave goods of Daba, there are material of Luristan inspiration. 
Considering that we do not have data, uh, data on the burial practices of the first tomb, we can focus on data from our excavation of the second grave, which provides us with a complex set of information about the position of practices of individuals and the treatment of skeletons over time. The organization of internal space occurred in different periods has completely changed the original deposition practice, showing us different type of deposition and accumulation of human remains. Several typology of inhumation have been identified that seem to follow a trend of changes in the ritual over time. The earliest phases are characterized by the prevalence of primary burial in close association with the wall structure. The overlying layers have yelled groups of human, uh, groups of human bones, often referable to deliberate human action which have called bone cluster. More recent and uh, superficial phases are characterized by scattered and fragmented bones that cannot be interpreted as intentional depositions. Later phases are distinguished by bone clusters containing the bones of more than two individuals. Some of these secondary depositions show a clearly structured shape that suggests the use of perishable containers, such as baskets, to keep the already skeletonized individuals inside or around the collective grave, while others are represented by isolated crania and the long bones or by scattered bone or fragments. The lower layer are, are characterized by the prevalence of primary burials containing single individuals in close association with the structure of the grave. The last two excavation season showed us a use by some um, late pre-Islamic group who have exploited the side access to the main corridor to set up some small burial chambers or even emptied existing room to put down more burials or have dismantled part of the perimeter walls. Like, like you can see in this slide that show a lot of chambers, uh, in particular, uh, on the wall, on the perimeter wall of the structure, not inside the corridor. This configuration represents the result of a series of transformation and reuses of the structure by different groups that have had access to the structure at a different time. Now let's describe the latest discoveries that refer to the arrangement that took place in the last phases of using the tomb. As mentioned, there are small rooms built on the perimeter walls or inside the corridor. We present only some examples of the several evidences exposing during the excavation. For example, this small circular chamber was set on the east wall through the removal of a part of the boulders of the wall, and therefore represent a clear example of reuse of this structure to create new burial chambers. 20 individuals have been identified in this chamber. Most are primary burials without grave goods, except for some simple iron daggers. Uh, but the first, the only, only the lowest burial instead is accompanied by three balsamarium and a large jar related to the late Iron Age summit period. This chamber is uh, the chamber A is the most relevant discovery of the last seasons. This represents the last phase of use of the structure, and like the chamber B. It was built dismantling part of perimeter wall. Originally, it was sealed by large slabs, as you can see in the small picture. And we have recognized at least two phases of human deposition. And we have identified 12 individuals inside, including four primary burials. The most recent phase consists of many skulls and bone clusters scattered, 
while the main phase shows three, prim three primary burials partially dismantled. A wealth of grave goods characterize this chamber. In this slide, you can read a list of recovered objects associated to the main burials. Most of the finds are in excellent condition and belongs to a cultural horizon coming from the uh, horizon that refers to so-called pre-Islamic period with specific parallels coming from the site like uh, Adur and Maleka and from the, the same Diba area. While the most direct confrontation in central Oman come from the necropolis of Al Fueda. In this slide, you can see some fine as bowls, sword and flax and the flasks in the original recovery context. Proceeding inside the central corridor, the first primary bias begin to appear, arranged along the base of the two inner walls, mainly on the eastern one, which is better preserved. These are often burial chambers containing three or four individuals laid on, on the top of the other and all accompanied by their grave goods. Some large slabs perfectly sealed this chamber set at the base of the east interior wall. This chamber was, out, was also built in the last stage of using the tomb when access to the central corridor was still possible. It contains two individuals, an infant and adult with associated animal deposition. The grave good consists of grooved bronze plate, ceramic plate, gold earrings, silver rings, necklace and bracelet. Also this room, for example, was built by leaning on the internal perimeter wall and is located next to the previous one. It contains two adult burials and the oldest is very similar to the previous one on the basis of the animal deposition on the feet and some ceramic elements such as the plates and the balsamarium. The grave goods are arranged around the skull and also contain a soft stone compartment vest. In this case, the individual show a dagger sticked in the head. Proceeding toward the end of the corridor, there are more primary burials, well organized in small chambers, bordered by stones and set against the walls. Some of them are very well preserved and present special features. They appear to be very homogeneous, both in terms of their grave goods, which refer to a phase between Iron Age III and the early summit period, and in terms of their characteristic animal offering. For example, this rich burial, identifying the lower pits of the corridor, showing two bronze vessels, three soft stone vases, two bone spindle, one stone lid, one balsamarium. But above all, a very uncommon custom you can see in this, uh, in this slide, very uncommon custom to keep a soft stone vase into the goat chest cavity. <clears throat> or for example, a warrior burial accompanied by an iron dagger with bone handle and a quiver consisting of eight bronze arrowheads. An animal offer, always goat, was placed near the feet. Another uh, widespread feature is the presence of burial accompanied by the typical axis of the Rumela type, period two, often laid near the skull and in some cases intentionally covered with a bronze vessel. And as already pointed out, the most common practice is the constant presence of animal offering and ceramic plates near the individual. These are often goats placed above the skeletons, near skulls, feet, or spinal column. The presence of dishes related to the offering is an interesting custom, constant and very interesting custom. In this scheme, you can see the minimum number of individuals, 293, divided in uh, bone cluster and primary burials, Ref uh, always referable to the second collective grave. 
To conclude the picture of the aspects related to the funerary practices and the position methods, it, it's surely interesting to show the latest discovery at the base of the corridor, which inform us about how the bottom of the chamber was used. I believe that is the first time that a central floor has been discovered consisting of a beaten clay floor that served as an internal pathway for the deposition of individuals. On both sides, we can recognize elongated pits with a primary and secondary burial or simply offering of object. The typical elongated pit under the wall foundation showing human remains accompanied by bronze vessel, pottery bowls, and soft stone vases. This is a final image of <clears throat> the last stages of the excavation of the corridor with the exploration of the pits on either side of the pathway. And now in this picture, we are really at the bottom of, uh, of the grave, uh, two meter deep from uh, the head of, uh, of walls. Okay, let's ask now to review the archaeological materials that characterize the two tombs according to the phases described above, starting from the second collective grave. The pottery reflects the main phase of occupation of the tomb, the Iron Age two and three, with a high proportion of painted pottery frequent on balls and the neck vases. A recording type is represented by spouted vases in the Iranian tradition with, with close comparison from some sites, uh, settlement in the Iran from, for example, Tepesialk. Large jars, rarely painted, as in this case, are also frequent, carinated jars. There are also several metal objects, mainly bronze, divided between weapons, and working tools, all belonging to the early stage of the Iron Age. The high percentage of tools, such as chisel or point or needle, represent a substantial difference with the first tomb, where we didn't find uh, metal tools, only weapons, and uh, maximum the maximum <clears throat> the bracelet. Several bronze and iron arrowheads several metal tools, including chisel, needle, pins, <clears throat> and the fish hooks. A few examples from the extensive collection of stone vessels, mainly in chloride. These are also part of the Iron Age production. Classical conical compartments and special vessels can be distinguished, while the decoration show mostly geometric motif, typical of the period alongside zoomorphic and phytomorphic motifs. <clears throat> also, the collection of leads is also significant, including, including circular ones with petals or radial decorations, and those with the biconical pommel with petals resembling a flower. <clears throat> More than 2,000 ornaments of various kinds were found as grave goods inside the tomb, including a gold earring and a necklace, beads, made using the granulation techniques, shell containers with pigment residuals, beads differing in shape, raw materials and sides, stone, bone, and shell pendants. Also stone tool, including whetstone, groundstone, and spindles, in addition to a unique arrow shaft straightener. Shell disc engraved with geometric, floral, and zoomorphic motifs, probably applied to the clothing or as a bracelet in view of the holes on the inner face. We wrote a paper on, on this, uh, subject with Ludwig and Alain David. 
An exceptional find is a terracotta cuboid incense burner with a geometric decoration on all four sides and four small feet. A truly striking parallel come from the Cueval settlement of Rumela. We present three seals found uh, at second collective grave in Daba. The first two are cylindrical seals that probably belong to a local production, but seem to imitate Elamite or Neo-Assyrian models. For example, Banket Sheen or uh, Anting Sin. Based on seen depicted. So far, I have shown a general overview of the various categories of archaeological material recovered in the second tombs. In detail, I would now like to show some objects related to the burials at the bottom of the chamber. So the, 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 the burial discovered in the last two seasons, where we arrived to the bottom of the chambers of the corridor. And thus probably the original ones the first to be placed in the chamber. The materials generally refer to the iron two and three phases, as can be seen from these images with Wadi Suk material considered as an heirloom. A large amount of bronze axes, typical of the early Iron Age, and the bronze bolts often lie upside down. Typical features of early Iron Age phases, like a phytomorphic design of the stone leads, beconical stone vase decorated with gardens, compartment stone boxes with a triangular composition, and the painted bridge spouted jars. Early Iron Age bronze small axes, probably with the ritual ceremonial function, considering the small dimension and the thin blade. According to the funerary practice, it's interesting the presence of heirloom as the late Wadi Suk conical vase and lid. They testify the continuity of use of special older artifacts over the centuries. Let's quickly review instead the most representative find recovered in the pre-Islamic chamber, the chamber A. Let's start with glazed pottery jars, find the main parallels in the South Mesopotamia and in Iran in general. In particular, this jar find a precise parallel from the graveyard of Amla in the central of Oman, uh, graveyard of al Fueda, and many sites in the Emirates. Glazed flasks and small vessels belong to the common pre-Islamic grave assemblage with parallels from Ed-Dur and al -Fueda. again. Some examples of a typical bronze bowls, two of them are decorated with horse figure in spout. Direct comparisons come from Leica, Ed-Dur and from central of Oman, uh, tombs from Samad and Samail. We have recovered also four sword and uh, iron sword, and they belong to the Samad pre-Islamic period assemblage and find parallels in the site of this period, uh, as Al-Fueda, Edu, Sinao, in particular, for the Uked grip handle. We have also many bone plaques with zoomorphic and anthropomorphic figures that find the precise parallel from Diba, Edur, and Meleka. Moreover, this anthropomorphic bone idol belong to the same category. We have discovered an example of Ujatai. It's an amulet made in faience and used it as a pendant in a necklace. According to the specialist, it suggests a row dating to the Egyptian late period or Ptolemaic times, let's say somewhere in the second half of the first millennium BC. There are similar amulets from Egypt, but there are some points that make us hesitate to say 
that it's of Egyptian origin. It might be an imitation, maybe from the Levant or maybe even local. We know at least three Ujat amulets from the peninsula, one from Taima, one from Daran region, and one from Karyat al -Fal. To conclude this overview of the main object, we present two very common categories, such as that of ornaments, mainly beads, necklaces, and pendants, and that of bronze pins connected to the soft stone spindles. In relation to this category, I would like to show you this object, probably of ivory. It's a cylindrical container in which a bronze pin is still preserved decorated with horizontal rib, a very precise comparison, very precise comparison, come from the Eddur ne necropolis. We cannot fail to mention the material from the first collective tomb and surrounding pits, which show elements that may date back to the middle of the second millennium BC. It's a unique assemblage with more than 3,500 objects and uh, about 5,000 5, beads. Among those are objects of great importance as they were imported from the northern and neighboring region. The collection of metal weapons represent a unicum in a, an archaeological overview of the Arabian Peninsula, in particular in reference to the funerary context. The large number of daggers more than 100, 139 to be precise, and arrowhead exceeding 2,500 units testify the great development of bronze metallurgy in this period and hence the need to acquire more sophisticated armaments. In addition to dagger and arrows, there are also sword and spirit alongside a large number of axes and alberts. The discovery of the remains of arrowheads joined together leads to think of the presence of quivers among the object of the grave goods, as demonstrated by the relief of the palace of Asurbanipal, which represents the Arabs intent to shooting arrows from a quiver on the back of a camel. Furthermore, the dating of this panel is comparable with the period of use of the second collective tomb at Daba. In this table, referring to the first collective tomb and pits, this evidence is easily appreciated through the exact quantities of the weapons found. The character emerging from the analysis of the period, and in particular of the material culture of Daba communities, is a vast range of artifacts that shed light on the nature and the extent of the long distant contacts of the local community. This object testify to a deep cross-cultural knowledge extending across the, the wider region during this crucial period in Arabian prehistory. Most exceptional is the discovery in both tomb of very rare and important artifacts in light of their significance for understanding of the long distance cross-cultural exchange networks that connected Southeastern Arabia to the wider region during the period. For example, three seals, two stone stamp seals and one Fayan cylinder seals, as well as a gold generated pendant and an inscribed ice stone derived from the first collective grave. The cylinder's iconography is carved in the Luristan provincial style of the late middle Elamite period. The main subject represented on the seal is a winged anthropomorphic creature with a raptor, maybe eagle's head. The ice stone shows the southernmost cuneiform inscription discovered to date and the only one found in Southeastern Arabia. It bears three cuneiform signs engraved in two lines to form the divine name Gula, the main Mesopotamian 
healing deity and the patroness of a doctor during the Kassite period. The number and the fusion of the Eistone and their textual mention increased in the late second millennium BC. Eistone bearing only the name of deity all day to the Kassite period. Stamp seals, despite quite difference from each other, both show feature which can variously derive for the demon sea traditions. Comparable gold granulated ornament have been found in graves at Marlik in the Jilan province of the Northwestern Iran. It may have been executed by the same workshop over a short period of time between the 13th and 12th century BC. In summary, I would like to use this table taken from a recent article by Paul Yule, where the three phases that characterize the first millennium BC are illustrated. We can say that in both tombs, all this period and cultural districts are represented, testifying the continued use of the funeral area over the centuries and the cultural continuity understood as a choice to continue to use the same funerary monuments by different group, different community. This is the last slide. I want to show three set of radiocarbon datings from the second collective grave. And we have the, the most ancient phase come from the walls of, uh, <clears throat> of the east walls of the second collective grave. And uh, the period refers to Iron Age II period, early Iron Age. We have from the inside, from the burial at the bottom of the corridor, two radiocarbon datings between the Iron Age three period at the first stage of the late Iron Age. And to conclude, we have two radiocarbon datings from the late pre-Islamic chamber, two different period. And uh, uh, both te testify the, 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 the pre-Islamic period on the basis of the general uh, knowledge. Thank you for kind attention. I'm Finch. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you very much. Welcome. It was brilliant. Uh, Sophie, do you want to uh, to uh, open your microphone? And uh, since we are not numerous, I, I think there should be uh, some questions, by the way, because we know, I think we, we know very well this uh, this topic. It is uh, once again impressive. A lot of things uh, was, um, I have no, no knowledge about, especially the last seasons uh, of your uh, excavations. And it's uh, 